to today's discussion. Before we get started, just a brief reminder regarding the housekeeping rules, and you may see some of those pop up on your screen before we kicked off just now. If you're not one of the speakers, please make sure that your video cameras and microphones are switched off throughout the event. Otherwise, my colleagues will switch them off automatically. Secondly, we will be using Slido to take questions for our panelists. So please don't write your questions via the chat box. Also, when submitting your question, make sure that who the question that you state who the question is for, of course. Also, for those who have joined using the WebEx link, you can access Slido directly by clicking multimedia viewer button on the right hand side of your screen. If you do not see the Slido load, you may need to close your chat or participant windows first. And then finally, in case you still need technical support during the event, please send a message via the chat function to A4E admin assistant or my colleague Jennifer Janssen, who will be happy to assist you further. With that, I'd like to hand things over to Dan to introduce our first guest. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Thomas. It's an a honor and a pleasure for me to be here. I, I, it's a fascinating and uh, tough time for the industry, uh, and there's a lot to cover in the next uh, hour and a half or so. Um, our first uh, speaker today, uh, uh, Volter Gitz, will be speaking on behalf of um, EU Transport Commissioner um, Adina Velayan, who unfortunately uh, is, is uh, busy today, I think, with the College of Commissioners, uh, dealing with including aviation issues. Um, and uh, checking to see if Mr. Goetz is uh, online with us. Yes, I'm here. Good morning, Dan. Good, Good morning. morning. Um, ah, excellent. Good to see you, too. Okay. Yes. Well, <laughs> Mr. Goetz, thank you very much for taking the time to, to be with all of us. Uh, these are busy times indeed. Uh, the commission took office back in December, and almost immediately, within weeks, you were you were hit with uh, the pandemic and the reaction. Um, can you maybe start by telling our viewers what what the commission, what um, Commissioner Valayan, have done to address the crisis in aviation um, so far this year? Yes, yes, and uh, good morning also to the audience listening um, wherever they are. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me uh, today. I uh, send you best wishes from Commissioner Adina Valian. She actually indeed is very busy today with the college decision this afternoon on the 2030 climate target and also the annual growth strategy for member states. So we are in the in full swing um, in dealing also with um, traditional policies like climate change and uh, helping member states with their resilience and coming out of the economic crisis. Um, Yes, and let me first start as this is the airline for Europe and an aviation panel, our full support uh, from the Commission side to your sector, to your industry, to the prosperity and uh, all what you have done in the last six months in difficult times in surviving uh, a never seen before downturn in passengers and air, air, air traffic operations. Uh, so um, you have our full support and uh, we, uh, we are here to also to work with you to, uh, to get out of this crisis. Um, in a nutshell, what has been done, uh, actually, there are so many experts in this call, I would not go too much in detail and rather leave, leave that to questions from your side, Dan. Uh, as we all have witnessed, I mean, the main thing I think what we have done starting from mid-March when the so-called uh, lockdowns happened was to coordinate member states to maintain as much as possible minimum uh, mobility and services and flow of good and tra uh, travel of people within the European Union uh, and on road, of course, also, but also for aviation. We have early on started with guidelines and interpretation aid. You uh, might remember uh, we have um, um, stated that uh, cancelled flights uh, do not lead to compensations uh, according to our 261 regulation because it's a uh, force majeure. Uh, uh, we have uh, made guidance early on on uh, um, on rail uh, on 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 air freight, 
uh, on our green lanes, uh, which is on road, but not only, I mean, uh, to keep mobility up also for essential uh, transport workers, pilots, uh, etc. Um, uh, we have also from the legislative side early on uh, started to adopt relief measures, um, which were necessary uh, as in the pandemic, some issues which we have uh, some some requirements could not be followed anymore by market participants and stakeholders, such as, for instance, licenses, uh, renewable of licenses, we have given derogations there and um, quite famous also the slots regulation, which we are currently already in the second wave of giving a waiver. Uh, for airlines who cannot use the slots uh, with these 80 20 rules on airports due to the pandemic. Um, yes, uh, in, in that sense, we have also um, uh, made guidance uh, to member states uh, on state aid to allow, and also, which I think was financially very important for many airlines in Europe, to allow for financial help uh, to airlines uh, in these difficult times. Um, without running into uh, legal constraints and the, in, if the, in, in the, on the EU side with our state aid rules. Um, that was uh, money then spent at member states level to airlines, as you were well aware, to Lufthansa, Air France and many others. Um, but we are at EU side have also adopted uh, quite an ambitious um, 750 uh, billion uh, next generation EU uh, investment program, which we are now about to implement. Uh, which gives um, a lot of possibility for member states and also companies through InvestEU and the EIB to get financing uh, um, in this uh, in these difficult times. So what I would say, Dan, to 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 sum up is uh, the European Commission has used its entire powers and possibility to guide and coordinate member states to do the necessary contingency or emergency measures on legislation on our side. Um, and to try to help that the sector survives and maintains its uh, minimum services. But I must say, um, in the end, the crisis was largely run by member states and by health ministers rather than by transport ministers. Uh, we have brought the transport ministers together with the health ministers and with the interior ministers when we um, coordinated through our Green Lanes network now. But in the end, the pandemic is something which has never seen before and has led us in uh, also in um, coordination and regulatory challenges which we have never seen before and uh, we are now in the in the being uh, epidemiologically on the second wave also in the second wave of policy making here in the european commission together with parliament and council in order to uh, look more now in resilience and making the sector uh, fit for future crisis or an extension of this horrible health crisis. I would leave it from there and see what where your interests are going to go more in detail, Dan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you spoke a lot about what the Commission has done for the industry, and clearly there have been a lot of measures taken. Can you talk a bit about passengers? Uh, flights are resuming, have resumed, passengers are still nervous. Um, and in part, they're confused. Can you talk also a bit about what's being done to uh, standardize things like testing, uh, policies on you know, when people leave an airport, arrive at another airport, and, and how all of that is being uh, efforts in, the, in those areas? Yeah, Dan, yeah. thank you. That's a very good question. I see here in the little picture that Patrick Key is in the call. Uh, hello, Patrick. Um, he has played a key role, of course, in uh, giving guidance um, together with our ECDC, which is the health uh, of, uh, agency in, in, uh, in Stockholm. Um, we have adopted already, Patrick Key has adopted uh, on his side, but the Commission has also together with EASA and ECDC adopted guidelines or recommendations in May on how to maintain safe and healthy uh, air travel uh, in the pandemic, which where we have made then um, recommendations to uh, member states and to airlines and airports about wearing masks, uh, hygiene uh, in the plane and on the ground, um, ensuring physical distancing, etc. So, um, in that regard, um, I think we have it help has helped a lot um, to give some. Um, principles and uh, and and uh, procedures uh, to 
airlines so that they could resume business when the lockdowns ended then in June. But um, I would say um, the most important thing what passengers need is trust. Uh, trust that the flight takes place, trust that they are healthy and safe in the plane, of course, Patrick is listening, that's the most important thing. But trust also that um, that the, um, the money which they spend for uh, buying a ticket is in the end not um, is in the end not uh, bringing the service which they have booked, you know. So and in that regard, um, um, the trust to bring trust back um, to the uh, sector, um, we are a bit at the limit in our transport policy making because in the end it's interior ministers and health ministers who had uh, sometimes border closings or flight restrictions or simple warnings like uh, do not travel over summer because you might not uh, safely come back. Uh, there were also, of course, these repatriation efforts in May, in, in, in beginning of the crisis. Uh, so that these are things which on the one hand are well justified uh, from the epidemiological situation. I don't want to touch on that. This is the business of health ministers and interior ministers. But these are issues are, of course, which have a huge impact on aviation, on all transport modes, but particularly aviation. Um, because uh, as long as, for instance, quarantine measures are out there uh, and also changing from week to week with different regions in Europe and beyond, um, it is very, very difficult to maintain um, aviation um, against a, let's say, persisting crisis um, which um, goes very much to the to the detriment of trust in the system of passengers. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Yeah. Yes, clearly there's a, an enormous amount that's far out of your control. Um, I know I know your time is limited this morning, so um, and, and I'd like to remind everyone online that we can take questions by Slido. Um, but one area that is in your control uh, is uh, slot waivers. Um, can you talk a bit about the situation there and for the winter season? Yes, that, that's a very good question. On slots, we are in the middle of uh, proceeding now with uh, basically three parts what we're doing. Now, first of all, we have to present a report. I think today, Gael, it's today, uh, 15th of uh, September, uh, that's today. We will present a report where we evaluate the situation of the slot waivers since the last six months. This is a legal obligation in the in this uh, slot regulation, which was um, was changed in, um, in in March. So we will come out with a report. At the same time, we will come out with a proposal for a delegated act under this um, waiver legislation, which we did in spring, to further extend the slot waivers for another six months for the full winter season into March. I think it's March next year. Uh, we were first considering whether it's necessary to have three months or six months, but in the meantime, after reflection, and we are now also closer to the winter season, uh, it seems uh, reasonable to go for a full waiver for this winter season to extend the waiver again. This, this is a delegated act, which needs still some six, eight weeks until adoption. Uh, because after the proposal, proposal of the Commission Delegated Act goes to the uh, to an expert group and also, of course, uh, to the Parliament for scrutiny. Uh, so, uh, the, but uh, the sector knows now that we are going for another six months uh, extension. And in parallel, then we are preparing uh, a, um, a targeted amendment, and that will be a legislative proposal, co-legislation, uh, to the slots regulation, where we will uh, make sure that. Should this crisis persist, and we don't, nobody knows where we are in spring next year, we would like to avoid that we go from waiver to waiver to waiver under the current regulation, which in the end does not allow uh, the European Commission to um, impose certain um, conditions uh, to another waiver. You know, I mean, waiver has advantages but also disadvantages because it heavily inter interferes in a well established. Uh, slots management system. So we do not want to, in the end, um, have the situation where these waivers um, <coughs> either give uh, advantage to the airlines or ad advantage to the airport or the other way around. That's why we are very grateful for the stakeholders. And I think Airline for Europe was involved. Airlines and airports together with um, air traffic managers have um, made a gentleman's agreement and communicated this also by letter to us over summer 
which will uh, serve as a good basis for us to uh, describe the, some conditions which we will propose to the co-legislator to put in the slot regulation over the next couple of months. Back to you. Well, I think we'll be able to pick up some of that in the next panel so we can dig in a bit more. Um, Walter Gitz, I, I, I know your, your schedule is very tight. Any- uh, uh, We'll have another five minutes or 10 okay, minutes. Okay, fine. If you like, huh? Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, how, you know, you've just laid out a rather complex process that, that this all has to go to. The, the airline industry situation really is, uh, it, it's, it's a house on fire. Is, is the, um, it, the mechanisms of the commission, are they adapted to this? I mean, just what is doable in the real time under the pressure that the, the industry faces? That's a good question. I, I don't think that the, 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 yes, the commission is of course ready to act within its um, uh, treaty uh, treaty uh, competences. Huh? I mean, we are the guardian of the treaty and we are the, we have the right of initiatives. We can take all necessary initiatives, uh, which we also have done and we will continue to do. So um, I think the commission is well placed to do from the European side what is necessary to on the one hand, tackle and on the other hand, prevent these kind of crises in the months to come or years to come. The limits which we have are more uh, with this complex system of member states competences, national competences for aviation, of course, also global context uh, done. I mean, um, it is absolutely regrettable that, for instance, the transatlantic aviation market is completely down currently which is not a, a guilt of the European Commission or the, or the, or the relevant airlines, but currently we have, uh, we have um, uh, uh, travel restrictions, you know. So we need to lift those travel restrictions. And, um, uh, and that's what, we, what we're going to do in the next couple of months, uh, try to bring back trust into the system with further efforts in coordinating member states. We have just last week adopted also Another recommendation, which was more in the hands of Ilva Johansson, our inter, uh, Commissioner for uh, Internal Affairs, so that member states coordinate when they adopt uh, um, uh, quarantine measures or they call zones green, red, green, red and, 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 and so forth. Um, maybe one word more also forward looking um, what we're going to do. You know, aviation is a sector which is, of course, also um, a, a, an important client for our twin, twin transition on greening, uh, Green Deal and the digitalization, which are flagship initiatives for this uh, commission. And uh, we will continue to work on that. Um, today, uh, the com commission will adopt the, the climate target for 2030 where we will go for at least 55 percent, which is a very ambitious climate target. Uh, this will be in the press this afternoon. College is, uh, starts uh, at one o'clock. Um, and uh, we will have to see then to what extent aviation will have to contribute, will have to contribute and can contribute and how to these climate targets um, uh, to reduce emissions uh, as it is necessary according to this impact assessment. So these are issues where we will look at in parallel to, uh, let's say, more emergency measures and resilience protocols to tackle the immediate crisis is also to uh, to see uh, how the sector can be more digital and more green. But we are fully aware on our side here in the you know, Commission of Allian and, uh, and, uh, and, and um, people working in the Commission on Transportation that we will not do this uh, without taking into account the new economic situation, the new normal after the pandemic then. I mean, um, obviously from starting the question by which will be reference years for emission reductions now in the future to what kind of investments can be done um, in, uh, in the near future. How does it look like with the investment capacity for fluid renewables, et cetera, the airport infrastructure in this situation, we have to have a close look on that. Um, what we would wish to see is an uptake of new technology and clean fuels uh, in airports and for air, airlines uh, in Europe in the years to come so that we get techn technological progress into the sector to tackle this, uh, this twin crisis, uh, twin, twin, twin projects. Huh? Back to yeah. you. Yeah, well, clearly one of the side effects of the crisis has been the, the, 
grounding of, of lots of aircraft, but especially the oldest and, and most inefficient. So that's likely to be a lasting impact. Uh, if I can come back to one thing that you mentioned, uh, the commission, I guess, in coordination with the German presidency is working to coordinate measures across Europe so that there is consistency. Can you talk a bit about more about what can be achieved there since, again, as you said, so much is in the hands of member states? Mm. We have a council meeting on 28th of September. Uh, again, a video call. This matters, uh, Dan. Uh, we are in a video call. But uh, for the EU institutions, it is very difficult to shape policies through video calls. Uh, don't underestimate for co-legislation and ministers' meetings how important it is that ministers meet physically uh, to strike deals uh, in the room and also uh, through, uh, through networking and bilateral talks. So we, are, we have now the second presidency, which is uh, already a video call presidency, I should say, after the creations. So we will see uh, um, the German ministry has, uh, the German presidency has made very good proposal and progress in the Transport Council to come forward with a pandemic um, uh, resilience protocol or pandemic paper in order to um, further specify and um, further harmonize in a, in a non-legal sense, but in a political sense, what member states can do in order to keep traffic um, up and with the sector resilient uh, during this crisis. We from the Commission side are fully supportive to this. We very much look forward to have this discussion with the Council on 28th of September. And we on our side also consider that the strategy on sustainable and smart mobility, which we will adopt in December, which will outline for the years to come our transport, future of transport uh, ideas, will have a good um, emphasis and portion of it also to the resilience of all modes of transport, including aviation, uh, during such crises and to get out of these crises. And what we think what we can do is basically to as much as possible um, uh, align the procedures taken at member states level according to epidemiological um, reasons so that everybody knows why and how decisions are taken so that we can have some predictability back and trust into the system. Uh, otherwise, uh, we will see years of, um, of low uh, air traffic uh, if people do not uh, trust booking tickets again and come back to the planes. Thank you. Yes. So that's- well, uh, Thank you. Thank yeah. you for your time and that uh, tour d'horizon and really well setting the stage for today's uh, discussions. Um, and I think everybody who's watching here Wishes you the commission luck and in, in, in the tasks ahead of you. They're they're large indeed, and there's much to be done. So okay. thank you for taking the time. Thank you, Dan. I switch off the micro then. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to switch now to our first uh, virtual panel discussion. Um, and I probably don't need to tell this to our audience, but just to, to set the stage that um, Eurocontrol has forecast that. Um, there are going to be 55% fewer flights in 2020 compared to 2019. That's just unimaginable a, a few months ago and, and something we've never seen before. Um, it's about 6 million fewer flights. And overall revenue for the entire industry, from airlines to plane makers to ANSPs, will be down. Uh, it'll be um, the loss is estimated 140 billion euros across the industry. So just enormous numbers. Um, and so here to discuss that, we have a panel. Um, I'm going to start with um, Ben Smith, who is uh, this year's uh, chair of the FA4E. Um, ben, you and I back in March at the uh, A4E annual meeting sat down for a, a, a fireside chat. Um, seems like a lifetime ago, we actually met in person without masks and talked about the state of the, the industry just as um, as things were starting to look uncertain and bad. Um, can you talk a bit about briefly the state, the overall state of the industry now and, and, and what are your top priorities from the airline's perspective? Okay, thanks, Dan. Yes, definitely a different world since, uh, since we last uh, since we last met in person. Uh, it's, I'm sure for this audience, it's not new, the impact uh, this virus has had on, uh, on our business. Uh, so you know, the number one or the 
the most important issues, priority issues that uh, we have as, as airlines, as A4E, ones we're focusing on, some that have already been mentioned uh, by Walter, definitely travel restrictions. Uh, these uh, have a major, major impact on our ability to uh, get back to uh, some sort of a level of business that is sustainable to ensure that, uh, that we have uh, profitable businesses and that we can be sustainable. Um, so we definitely support a European common approach to travel restrictions to offer uh, clarity, predictability to citizens and airlines. You know, many of our, our customers, uh, even if a, a market is open, uh, still very reticent to fly because of the unknown surrounding restrictions and because these restrictions are, are changing uh, day to day. Um, so, you know, on, on September 4th, the, uh, the EC uh, said are pretty much uh, aligned with that. So member states should uh, hopefully, I mean, this is what we're, what we're hoping for, um, implement a common approach uh, that is completely uh, coordinated. Um, we're hoping that the EC can work with ICAO and the World Health Organization to make sure its system of color coding, the one that we're using uh, here today is promoted as the world standard. Um, and in the absence of harmonized measures and with travelers' reluctance to travel, uh, you know, the industry uh, already is and will be further crippled to an extent that the recovery uh, will definitely not happen in, uh, in the foreseeable future. So we're looking also for mandatory testing, either at departure or on arrival, preferably at departure. Uh, this, uh, we believe, um, will help uh, with tracing to avoid uh, border closures, um, quarantine, uh, movements, restrictions uh, when possible. So definitely mandatory testing is something uh, that we'd like to see in a uniformed uh, way, a uniformed accepted way across uh, across the world. So uh, Walter mentioned the slot waiver uh, for the full winter 2020, 2021. So we very much welcome that. This is something that we were lobbying hard for. Uh, you know, the words that uh, he mentioned today, uh, very comforting so that uh, our airlines can plan appropriately especially, as I said, with all these things I just mentioned here, with all these unknown travel restrictions and unknown whether mandatory testing will take place and the comfort um, and I say, ability to confidently book, which is still relevant from our customers, uh, this is great. So we can, uh, we can ensure that the resources that are needed to keep uh, our airlines going are appropriate and that we don't uh, fly unnecessary schedules, unnecessary flights, just to ensure that uh, our airlines maintain their, uh, their valuable slot. So that is, uh, that's great news. EU 261, also a pr priority, which Walter mentioned. So we definitely need a review uh, of this uh, policy. Uh, it needs to be balanced in the, interest of, in the interest of passengers and airlines, you know, with all these new, uh, you know, you know, all these new requirements for us to cancel flights relatively close in for all kinds of reasons. Uh, 261 uh, during this period is, uh, is extremely, extremely uh, cumbersome and very, very has a has a big imposition on us uh, financially. Um, he also mentioned the Green Deal and uh, support for sustainable aviation fuel development, which is very important for us. Uh, specifically, which, what what uh, some of you may know in France, this um, this uh, citizens' uh, uh, proposal, uh, which uh, could result in a new tax of between thirty and 400 euros, depending on the class of travel and distance flown, uh, do not support emission reductions and are in fact counterproductive as uh, they for sure deprive us from finances that would be otherwise invested in environmental projects. So we're very, very much against uh, this, uh, this proposal. And then equally distortive is the, in, in the Netherlands, this uh, Greenpeace's demand uh, to cap CO2 emissions with a linear reduction over the years. Um, this would put the airline sector uh, in the Netherlands on a totally unequal footing compared to their competitors, obviously with job losses and loss of connectivity, um, with serious consequences. So not very helpful if we want to uh, to get out of this crisis. So those I would say are the top uh, top items, top uh, subjects that, uh, that worry us, concern us. Okay. Thanks for that introduction, Ben. I'm going to turn now to Patrick Key. Patrick is the executive director of the uh, European Aviation Safety Agency. 
not long ago, your main concern was airplanes in the sky. Uh, for a while, there were practically none. And, and now I would imagine you've sort of had to redefine safety uh, for aviation. Can you talk a bit about uh, how EASA has addressed this crisis, what you've been forced to change? And now as aviation attempts to come back, how does the, the situation look? And I can see that you're, oh, that, okay, good, you're unmuted. Uh, now it's muted again. Okay, there you go. Yeah, okay, I think they're changing it there. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me now? Okay. Good morning. So, so indeed, um, uh, the planes on the ground are safe, uh, and that's obvious. So we 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 had uh, uh, less uh, incidents reported to us, safety incidents, but uh, nonetheless, uh, we were kept extremely busy, as you can imagine. Uh, not only on uh, dealing with the crisis, but also on trying to find the safest way to return to normal operations. And um, in order to deal with the crisis, basically we have worked a lot with uh, uh, airlines, airports, uh, air traffic control service providers, uh, uh, national administrations to make sure that uh, all the things that uh, uh, are, are normally routine checks on, um, you know, on the on, 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 on the safety of the system or of the personnel could still be done uh, without having uh, planes flying. So typically, you know, uh, pilots licenses uh, which uh, are supposed to be renewed uh, when the pilots are, uh, are flying a certain number of hours. Uh, this could not be done uh, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the previous context. And therefore, we had to find a lot of uh, ways to make sure that uh, pilots could maintain their licenses uh, and, and uh, that uh, whenever uh, the, the traffic would start again, they, they could uh, uh, seamlessly uh, start again. Um, as, as mentioned by, by Walter, um, we in EASA, together with ECDC, published in May uh, very important uh, guidelines, uh, health safety protocols, which were recommendations, so there was nothing mandatory in it, but they were basically aiming at uh, trying to find uh, the right compromise for dealing with passengers uh, in a healthy manner. And uh, I don't know if you remember those times, but uh, in April and May, the health authorities uh, around the world had uh, the image of uh, transport in general, but in particular aviation, as a risk rather than, uh, than uh, uh, a support. And basically, you know, they were trying to push for those ideas about, uh, uh, you know, the middle seat, uh, unoccupied and things like this. And we had to make a, a lot of work proving to the health authorities that there could be ways to mitigate the risk. And uh, the result was this uh, health protocol, which uh, I think uh, has been uh, quite successful in Europe. Uh, and it's been implemented, I think, although it's not mandatory uh, throughout uh, the European states. I just uh, wanted to, to give you some, um, some figures uh, because we, um, uh, we, we did uh, sign a charter with uh, airlines and airports um, in order to monitor uh, the implementation of the protocols and to see where there were problems uh, or where there were areas that uh, needed to be updated. And I would just like to share with you some statistics because I, I think they are quite interesting. Uh, and in particular for the, the last uh, week of August, um, in our charter we capture about 40% of the total traffic in Europe. So we are capturing about uh, 3 million passengers. And out of those 3 million passengers, 180 passengers were not allowed to travel or were disembarked due to COVID symptoms. So that means six passengers out of 100,000. You know, we use a lot of those 100,000 uh, uh, cases uh, or statistics uh, in the pandemic. And so six passengers per 100,000 were not allowed to travel. Seven passengers uh, showed uh, COVID symptoms on board the aircraft. That's a 0 0.2 passenger per 100,000. And uh, 300 passengers were reporting as not adhering to the protocol. That's 10 passengers per 100,000. 
On top of it, uh, we monitored very closely the infection rates among airlines and airport staff, where we showed that, uh, in fact, there was no specific peaks uh, for airlines and uh, airport uh, staff uh, compared to the national uh, average uh, rate of infection. And why did I, do I give you all those data, all those statistics? Basically, what they are showing in my view, is that um, uh, air transport does not generate new cases. Air transport is uh, as healthy a system as anything, and certainly healthier than most of the most of the the, the, the other transport modes, and and also. Uh, healthier than most of the common things that people do, like go going grocery shopping and so on and so forth. And I think that, uh, you know, when, when we started uh, traffic again in, in, in June, passengers were fearing of flying because they didn't know, you know, w whether they would be uh, catching the disease on board an aircraft or, or at an airport. I think now we have proven that people should not fear flying because they, the probability that they catch the disease when they are flying is very low. And, and I think that uh, that's one of the key, uh, key factors in rebuilding the trust or the confidence of the passengers into the system. The next one will be, and that's, I think, uh, the, the highest problem, obstacle for, uh, for more uh, traffic, at least in Europe, it's the uncertainty on uh, the, your destination. You know, how are you going to be processed by the health authorities when you arrive? Are you going to be submitted to, uh, to quarantine, to testing? How are you going to be treated? And how are you going to be processed when you come back in your origin country? And I think that there, uh, what uh, Walter explained, uh, which is uh, the, the, the initiative from the Commission to have a common risk assessment, common scheme, for the processing of, uh, of uh, citizens in Europe will help tremendously because it will provide certainty to people on how they are going to be treated when they arrive. And I see that myself when I am traveling or when I'm planning for a, for, for, a, for a trip, I try to see, you know, how long I'm going to stay there, how, what are the measures that I, I'm going to be submitted to and uh, whether it's uh, reasonable to go or not. And I really do believe that um, uh, there we need a common European approach to it. And discussing with our international partners, this would help tremendously on the international scene, also for uh, partner countries such as Korea, you know, China, Japan, uh, Singapore, and so on and so forth, to consider reopening uh, travel from Europe to those countries if they know exactly how it's going to, to, to take place, if they know and they adhere to the, to the scheme of you know, green, orange, amber, or, or, or red, that they understand, they have clarity, certainty on what is the level of, um, of the pandemia in the different countries where they can reopen traffic. So I, I believe that uh, that's uh, going to be one of the major keys for uh, um, having a new normal uh, traffic also on the international scene. I will just finish by, by, by telling you that um, uh, from a safety perspective, um, we were concerned uh, with uh, the, the return to, to operations that, uh, you know, an aircraft is not like a washing machine. So if it stays, it's not used. You, you, you need to perform a certain number of uh, tasks in order to make sure that it's safe to fly. So, so we uh, issued a lot of guidelines on how to uh, deal with uh, the aircraft when they were on the ground, but also to prepare them for, uh, for flying again. We did the same for the pilots. You know, if you haven't flown for three months, six months, uh, you need to uh, be retrained in some way in order to, 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 to come back to the automatisms that, uh, that, you, that you have. This is also true for uh, air traffic controllers, for maintenance engineers, for a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, different uh, professional um, uh, categories in our sector. And last but not least, um, the economic 
impact of the, that the COVID has on the sector means that a number of uh, companies throughout the supply chain are struggling in order to uh, just uh, keep alive, uh, keep being alive. And that's where we know that uh, sometimes shortcuts are made uh, in terms of safety. And that's where uh, we also are um, uh, triggering a lot of uh, uh, vigilance from the supervisory authorities, the national administrations, in order to make sure that uh, no shortcuts are taken on safety uh, because uh, it's, uh, it's uh, still uh, our highest priority to maintain safe and efficient air travel. That's what I wanted to say to you, Dan. Thank you, Patrick. That's a, you really covered quite a lot there. Um, you touched on air traffic controllers. I'm going to turn to Simon Huckard now. Um, Simon, just like Patrick used to be worried about planes in the air, you used to be worried about overcrowded skies uh, and finding routes for airplanes. And, and now you're, you're dealing with uh, something you've never seen before, just a phenomenal drop in traffic. Can you talk a bit about what the um, air navigation service providers have gone through and what the outlook now is, especially with this plunge in, um, in your revenue? Yeah, thank you, Dan. Um, actually, a lot, of the, a lot of the things that ANSPs have been concerned about has already been mentioned by both um, Ben and, and Patrick. I was very pleased to say that Patrick said aircraft safe on the ground. They're also safe in the air. I just want to assure everybody that's li listening, they are definitely safe in the air, the ones that are flying. Um, just a couple of numbers. Europe actually is is probably the most impacted region in the whole world in terms of in terms of the levels of traffic's gone down. As, as you mentioned, fifty five percent fewer uh, fewer aircraft flying actually in twenty twenty. Globally, we hit the we hit the lowest point I think in in mid April, which is down eighty percent globally. So eighty percent down, and since then it's grown one hundred and thirty five percent. Now that sounds a great number. But actually, it's still 34% down on uh, what we were this time last year, uh, which is slightly better than what it is in Europe. So Europe's got that, that challenge and, and it comes back to this consistency, um, predictability from both a health perspective as well as a flying perspective that both Ben and Patrick have, have said in Europe. That, I think, is one of the biggest challenges that we face. From an ANSP perspective, um, they had two challenges to start off with. The two challenges were... There were still aircraft flying, um, and and therefore you have to provide the services to to the aircraft that are are in the air, and to do that whilst maintaining health for their employees to ensure that they could provide those services was quite tricky because it's you know, they're often in a, a closed um, uh, closed facility, whether that's a tower, whether that's a, an air traffic control center. So keeping the team separate and healthy was a real key challenge to start off with. And they lots of innovative ideas and ways of doing that, um, from using contingency towers to remote towers to real towers uh, and having teams wholly separated to make sure they could do that safely. Um, the other challenge as we've gone through this is training. And, and again, Patrick mentioned um, about pilots. Controllers have a similar challenge. It's quiet, it's quieter. Uh, and controllers are, are trained up to a very high level or high level standard, high capacity of aircraft in the sky. So to be able to keep that skill set honed and ready for when, and there are still peaks and troughs in, in traffic um, um, throughout the days. Uh, is, is a big challenge in terms of making sure all our controllers are, are focused um, and readily available and capable of, of delivering what needs to be delivered. Um, as a result of all this, I think um, it, come, it does come back to finances um, uh, in, in that there is a lot less money, obviously, in the system. People don't fly, so therefore there's no passengers. That affects the airlines, which means that they don't fly as many aircraft. That affects the ANSPs. And both of those regrettably impact the airports. You know, lack of passengers and a lack of lack of aircraft. Um, that's where the crunch really happens um, at, at the airports. So we do need to make sure that the whole li aviation life cycle is, is funded. Um, we talk about state aid. We talk about state aid for airlines. Uh, absolutely. We also need to talk about state aid for the whole whole aviation life cycle, whole ecosystem. It all does need to be supported, uh, and we're very keen to you know, to to help um, and to work together to be able to make that to be able to make that happen. 
The other challenges um, are, um, it's interesting, the environment was mentioned and, and, and we do need to keep an eye on that. Um, sustainability of aviation, uh, I think during this period has, has come to the fore again, less aircraft flying in the sky, people can see that. Uh, so sustainability is, is coming back to the top of the agenda. We heard all the comments already this morning about how important that is. Uh, and I agree with that. And we do need to we do need to make some focused attention um, on, on, on that whole sustainability of aviation, because this is temporary. We know this is temporary. Um, we don't know how long, but we know it's temporary and it will come back and we need to be ready for that when it does. So that's um, so that's um, um, particularly important. And the last um, one I mentioned here now is the temporary nature of of this pandemic we do need to keep an eye on the future and that's the whole of the aviation industry is to keep an eye on the future everybody is making necessary decisions about cost cutting uh, whether that's furloughing whether that's redundancies whether that's you know all all, all, all all the really unpleasant stuff that we're all having to do this traffic will come back and, and if i cast my mind back to 2008 when we had the financial crisis and i'm not comparing the two from a from a you know pandemic financial crisis but the impact on the aviation industry was such that it took 10 years to recover because lots of decisions were necessarily made in 2008 to stop investment in infrastructure to stop investment in new technologies if we do that again and we don't keep an eye on the future when the recovery does come we won't be in a position to be able to maximise that opportunity as as a whole of the aviation industry, and that's a that's a that's a real concern that we do all of us uh, need to keep an eye on. Particularly, you know, we know that ATM has a different business model to airlines. Um, airlines have the ability to be agile, to be um, to far more commercial and, and and flexible, and be able to do things very quickly. When you're dealing with national infrastructure, the programmes are often longer. Uh, uh, to be able to get into service. So to be able to bring those two models as close to possible as together to enable the whole of the industry to be as flexible and agile as possible, I think is a real key for the future. And I think technology plays a big role in that. Simon, thank you very much for, for that perspective from Canso and, and the air navigation service providers. I'm gonna turn now to uh, Javier Marin, who is um, Airports Managing Director at IANA. Um, for the the airport perspective, uh, you know, uh, planes are empty and so are airports. Um, I've been through a couple myself, and it's a bizarre experience these days. And uh, so, from the passenger perspective, things are are upended, and your entire business model, um, which relied on having planes and passengers, is uh, in trouble. So, can you give the perspective of you know the world as you see it from on the ground at the airport? I think you're starting. Uh, th thank you, Dan. Good morning, everybody. Well, airports are suffering as much as the other agency in the in the in this industry of air transport. Uh, you know, for, since January, we are losing uh, 1.2 billion passengers at our airports in Europe. And uh, according to the prevision we did in July, we are going to lose 64 percent of our passengers at the end of the year, and we are going to lose. Uh, 67% of our revenues at the end of the year. Well, as I say, and this is a prevision we did uh, in the association in ACI in July, but uh, these figures uh, uh, are optimistic if we take into account how September, September is going. If you look at uh, the beginning of the crisis, we, we were very supportive with the, with the efforts of the Commission in establishing rules for the uh, for the lifting of the of the travel restrictions we had uh, on those days in March, April, May, uh, we were cooperating and com in close cooperation with the rest of the agents, with the airlines, with the ground handlers, with our national regulators, and uh, finally under the leadership of IASA and ECDC, and I want to to thank Patrick Key for the leadership uh, of of uh, IASA to get a common regulation just to, to open the airports, to start flying. And um, my view is that uh, we got a good result. I mean, uh, we, we got uh, recommendations. That is not good because recommendations uh, are not mandatory. At some countries, are in Spain, uh, uh, the full uh, set of recommendations uh, became mandatory. At some other states, uh, uh, some of them were adopted, but 
I think uh, air transport has been working uh, well. I think uh, at this moment, airports and, and uh, flights are one of the safer uh, places uh, to be in this in this moment, and we don't have uh, cases reported of infection uh, neither in the at the airports or, or in a flight. No, so uh, well, the recovery was modest. Uh, but we had recovery. We started uh, recovering uh, our flights in, in June. Uh, we recovered only 7% of our passengers. Um, uh, with, uh, we, we applied uh, social distancing, hygienic measures, uh, boarding and these uh, new procedures. Well, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, measures that arrived from the, from the IASA uh, recommendations. And uh, in July, we got a recovery of uh, uh, 22%, uh, modest but uh, well, good after what we expected in, in May. And in August, uh, we recovered uh, 30%. We lost 70%. It's a lot, but uh, we we continued recovering uh, in the, the traffic we have had uh, last year. Uh, however, in September, uh, because of the of the restrictions that uh, some states uh, uh, decided uh, to, to impose on the travel restriction at the end of July, we have seen how uh, these recovery rates have uh, going down. Then the, this, this month, traffic is not, uh, is not going probably uh, to reach the 30% uh, of average we got in August. So the main reason uh, were these uh, restrictions. Of course, uh, these restrictions were due to the spikes of the virus that uh, were appearing at some regions in Europe. But uh, these restrictions were imposed without a common criteria in an uncoordinated way, without a prior communication to the Commission or to the, or to the states. So they have provoked a very important and negative impact on the recovery rate. And what is even worse, they have provoked a very important negative impact in the consumer confidence. So, uh, what should we do to, to recover, to restore that uh, confidence of the consumer and to continue with the recovery? Well, at this moment, for me, the, the most important, even if there are other points that we should refine from the, from the things we are doing now, uh, we should be able to answer to a couple of questions. Uh, first one is, in which cases a state states should apply restriction to mobility and to air travel. And the second one is uh, uh, which measures should be applied in those cases. Are two different uh, questions that we need an answer very soon in order to recover the consumer confidence. And, and of course, we should need a harmonized answer to that question, no? what is very, very important. No? Uh, well, we, are, we welcome very much the initiative of the Commission to answer the first question, in which cases states should apply uh, uh, limit restrictions to, to air travel. Uh, the, the recommendation uh, uh, approved by the Commission last uh, 4th of September is, is good. We welcome that, but it's not enough. We think that we need to answer to the second part, uh, which measures should we apply and which measures with a common agreed protocol. And in that case, I think we, sh we have to go to, to replace uh, uh, quarantines, blanket quarantines, with uh, with testing, uh, and for me that's the main point at this moment. And because the rest of the things I think the industry is doing properly, uh, we are in the position to continue cooperating with the rest of the members, airlines, etc., and of course uh, with uh, supporting in what is needed with, to IASA or other institutions. But we need to answer that. We need to, to, to remove those uh, uh, blanket restrictions. Okay. Thank you for that perspective. Um, in the few minutes we have remaining, I'm going to turn to Slido. We have a um, first question came in from Mary Eccles. Uh, is, with the recovery slower than expected, do you foresee a second round of state support for airlines? Uh, have the airlines been in discussions with governments about this? I guess that's one for you, Ben. Um, you know, both in your Air France KLM capacity and, and in your A4E capacity, can you talk a bit about you know, looking forward and discussions on these areas, if there have been any?
sorry. Okay, there we go. Uh, oh, definitely. I think right now, what uh, from an Air France KLM perspective, and for many of the airlines that uh, A Free represents, and other airlines around the world, that uh, the main focus today is on is on ensuring that uh, our our cash, the exit of our cash, uh, remains as small as possible, but also on transformation efforts. Uh, there were already many um, uh, transformation programs in place at some of the larger carriers uh, prior to the crisis. Those are being accelerated. Uh, fleets are uh, big decisions on fleets are being made, which aircraft should be grounded. As we've been seeing a lot of A380s, uh, airlines with fleets of A380s have made some big decisions. Uh, but in terms of uh, future aid or additional aid uh, by governments or others, I think today the uh, the main focus is on how do we get through this short term crisis as quickly as possible or as smoothly as possible, um, and how do we ensure that we are best set up for the medium and long term, uh, and then of course uh, once we have a good idea of of what that could look like, then of course uh, seek support from the rest of our stakeholders to make sure it's uh, it's achievable. Okay, thanks for that. Simon, a couple of questions for you. Um, bottom line, isn't isn't this crisis a chance to shake up um, air traffic management, uh, both the way it's done, and and do you need to reassess, you know, revenue sources? Um, yeah, I see the question there. Is, I think a crisis is there's always an opportunity um, in in any crisis, and I think that, that's absolutely right. We shouldn't. We should be able to change the things that, that can be changed and should be changed for the future. There are some good things in the past that were, you know, were great. For example, our safety record. I think we should maintain that as, as a key as a key example moving forward. I think it's about getting the balance. The problem with the crisis that we're in at the moment um, is that there's a lack of funding available. So if there's no funding available to make the advances in both from a technological point of view, um, to really to really invest in the new technologies that are available is a challenge for the ANSPs at the moment, trying to balance day-to-day -day costs versus um, future costs. Um, but there is an opportunity there to bring, to really focus on, I think, Aviation industry is great at running at 100 miles an hour doing 100 things. So what about, what's the five big things that we should be doing? You know, the other 95 are nice to house, but what's the five really big things we do? And that's what we should be focusing on. So I agree with, agree with the question that we should be focused on those, but it's not just the ANSPs and technology. I think there's an opportunity to improve the regulation um, and the, reg the, the regulatory models that we're all facing. I'm a big believer in becoming much more output focused rather than input focused, you know, safety performance, um, capacity performance, environmental performance, efficiency performance. That's where we need to really provide that regulatory reform uh, to make it. If combine those two internally and externally, and I can see a different model emerging. Uh, and I can see different models where where states, member states, can take advantage of of this opportunity in both the medium and long term, while still concentrating today on still providing the services that are needed because they're still you know 50 percent of aircraft are still flying okay thank you um we're going to wind up this first panel in a couple of minutes in a minute patrick i'm going to come to you with a, a question about um passenger confidence um but before that uh FDA, if i can um you talked about how traffic has come back a bit over the summer obviously it was a lot of um uh, holiday travel, uh, events like this, virtual conference, show how much business can be done uh, online. Uh, Mr. Goetz was talking about how important it is to get people together so clearly, but how concerned are you that business travel is going to take a long time to come back and how big an impact is that going to have? I, I think you need to unmute. Well. Uh... Uh, I think uh, this unprecedented crisis uh, has brought uh, a uh, huge experiment with technology. Uh, no one of us uh, thought uh, we could do so many things with, uh, with the video and so on. So I think uh, things are going to change. I mean, things are going to change. Anyway, I think uh, tourism is one of the main industry of the, of the world. I think uh, people want to travel, people want to visit their 
the relatives. So uh, I think all of us are going to to reduce our our trips because well, uh, there is, there, we have seen that uh, there is no make sense uh, to to take a flight to have a one hour meeting in in London or in Brussels or in, in Paris or in other whatever other place. But uh, well, I am optimistic about uh, the future of air transport. I think uh, the industry is continue reinventing the model. People want to fly. People want to know uh, other places, and, and well, uh, we'll see that effect. But I don't think that will be the main the main issue to consider in the recovery. I think there are other things as the the uh, situation of the economy. I mean, how this this pandemic is going to affect the economy uh, of the citizens, how much time uh, is going to take to recover the, the confidence, not only because, uh, um, restrictions and so on, because, well, people, uh, uh, some people, uh, perhaps uh, elder people do not want to fly and will, will, uh, will, uh, it will take some much time to, to recover that confidence. So the, for me, in the short time, uh, the, the, those are the main concerns in terms of the recovery. Yeah. Okay. So, Patrick, I'm going to come to you for the last word because safety in aviation is the last word. The statistics you rattled off sound impressive. Um, you know, and I think six, nine months ago, no one outside this community had heard of a HEPA filter. But how do you get out the message about the safety of aviation and how do you overcome? people's concerns about getting on an airplane? Well, are people still concerned about getting on, on an airplane? I'm not sure, honestly. Um, and uh, we are going to to, to try to um, uh, issue a survey with uh, A4E and, uh, and ACI uh, in order to get you know the people's perception of uh, how safe they feel from a pure safety standpoint, but also from a health safety st standpoint flying. I, I think um, where we, we, we can still make progress is on the fact that uh, there are a few airlines uh, which are still not applying our protocols fully. And this doesn't help because, you know, uh, passengers are more and more intelligent, uh, smarter and smarter. They share their experience on the social networks and they see discrepancies and, and we hear uh, a lot about uh, you know, discrepancies between, you know, how things are done on one airline and how things are done on another airline. And then maybe that's uh, something where it could help us if uh, all your members could, uh, you know, apply uh, our, um, our, our, our protocols. Uh, I think it would help tremendously uh, the industry at large and restoring this uh, passenger confidence. In terms of, um, of uh, safety, uh, we have not seen any major safety incident related to COVID in Europe. Although in the world, uh, uh, there, there were uh, accidents in, in Pakistan uh, that you heard of where, uh, you know, one may wonder if uh, those accidents would have happened uh, without the COVID crisis, because in, in particular, the, the, the pilots did not seem to be uh, as fluent in, in, in the way they were conducting their flights are, uh, as they should have been. So, but uh, so far in Europe, uh, I think we, we have done well. Uh, when I say we, it's uh, mostly the industry, but also the authorities in making sure that uh, uh, we, would safe, we would safely fly uh, in, in Europe, regardless of the number of uh, aircraft flying. And uh, I think, you know, uh, what matters for us the most is uh, that, uh, as you say, safety is uh, the, 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 the last word or the, the first word. Uh, health safety should be uh, one of those as well. And I think that uh, our industry is doing whatever it can to be safe and to be health safe. And uh, we are proving uh, it by, by doing all the things that we are doing every day. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you to all the panelists. Uh, it's covered a lot of ground and, and uh, very interesting. There's clearly still a lot more to be done. And I guess our next panel will address that. I'm going to hand off now to my old friend, Victoria Moores, who is European Bureau Chief at Air Transport World. And I'd like to thank A4E for inviting me and for this opportunity. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dan. And it's a pleasure to be with all of you this morning. Um, it's been great hearing from all the speakers so far that have really set the scene for this next panel, which is all about building back better. So right now I'm going to introduce my three panelists and invite them to uh, start up their videos and also take themselves off mute. Um, so we have joining us uh, Sebastian Mikosh, who is um, the Senior Vice President for External Relations with IATA. Good morning, Sebastian. And then also we have Johan Lundgren, who is the Chief Executive of EasyJet. And from the European Parliament, we have uh, a member of the TRAN Committee, who is Caroline Lechgal. So good morning, everyone. Good morning. So starting up with this um, idea of building back better, it brings to mind the idea of at the moment we seem to be going through one step forward, two steps back. As we see the evidence of the recovery, but then we also see things slowing down with this patchwork. And I think the idea that I'd like to bring to the panel this morning is that this isn't just sort of moving forwards and backwards, that it's actually more like a spiral staircase and that it may feel as though we're going backwards, but hopefully we're progressing upwards with the recovery. And sort of turning to, to what we heard this morning, uh, we heard from Mr. Brooks from the Commission, who was saying that the Commission has tried to do its best to keep things moving. We've had um, amendments, minor amendments to EU 261. We've had relief measures in terms of licensing, in terms of state aid, and also this idea of uh, the European funding, which might be available to move things forward. So um, if Sebastian is here from IATA, can I just check in with you? Sebastian, if you're online, I'm not actually hearing you just there. So I'm gonna check in instead with Johan. Are you online and are you ready to, uh, to hear me? Yes, I, I see you and I hear you. Do you see and hear me? I do indeed. Morning, Johan. So Very good, good morning. Good morning. We heard there about um, the measures that are being rolled out to try and make it that we can climb this spiral staircase to get out of this recovery and to emerge better. Looking at what's been done by the European regulators so far, how do you think they're doing? How you, would you assess the measures that are being put into place with this very difficult, uncontrollable situation that we've been facing? First of all, I think that there's a number of lessons to 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 have been you know uh, taken into consideration from what we've been going through here. On one hand, you have to appreciate also that this is so unprecedented and it's never been there before to the scale of what we're seeing. So so therefore, you could you know excuse you know. Um, you uh, decision makers and authorities and also the industry in itself for not being knowing exactly how. A couple of things that stands out. I think, uh, you know, a, a lack of commonality around the measures that should have been put in place. And, and you know, both when it comes to the to the discussion about testing, as an example, but also the, the negotiated policies around the travel restrictions. Confidence to fly again, is it safe to travel? It's more about the fact that there is a tremendous confusion in 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 Europe uh, that exists around these restrictions, travel restrictions and quarantines that's been introduced, uh, air corridor introduced and being removed. So we know from service that we've done that actually more confusion among consumers that makes them to avoid their that's a tremendous difficult situation to, to operate in as an airline. So one is that there needs to be a common approach when it comes to the things that has to do with the testing and then also with, with the, the, the measures like quarantine. But also, and I must say that when you're looking through the, the, the various state actions and the governments, measures and support for individual tremendous difference in its approach uh, there, there's been a very useful report done by H where they show that the level of state aid and the and the support to different airlines you know varies tremendously now you could excuse that and you could respect that in in the term 
you know, at least governments do appreciate how important, you know, the aviation industry is for the economic recovery. But I think as Simon was mentioning earlier, that, you know, the aviation industry con consists of many components. It's just not only one or two or three, four is in need of that and if we want the industry and and as we do know we need the industry to be there as the economic recovery takes place i'm arguing and i think it needs to be a general support that goes out through the whole of the sector and that also needs to be taken into consideration when looking at measures that a e and ourselves are proposing removal of of taxes as an example atc charges is another example of that. But I think it's the commonality and the common approach that needs to be now put in focus rather than the more protectionism and the nationalistic approach that we see has been taking place. Thank you, Johan. Um, I'd like to bring in Caroline now as uh, a regulator. Um, so in terms of the European Parliament and responding to what Johan brought in there, saying that we need commonality, we need more consistency, more predictability. What would be your response in terms of the Parliament to that? Yes, thank you so much, Victoria. And well, let's start by saying when you look to what's happened in the world regarding the, the, the pandemic, I think aviation, and that was what Johan also mentioned and all the previous speakers, that aviation has suffered, well, on an unprecedented painful blow that that will be felt for years to come. Um, however, in order to emerge stronger from the crisis, uh, the steps already taken in innovation must not stagnate and also further investment must be made in sustainability. And then you come to your question, what will be the role of course also from the parliament? Because I think that it should be, yes, the public, but also uh, it's very welcome that it should be a private uh, public and a private effort and um, well the, the fact is what what could we do now and I think it's important that we could stimulate that we will become more resilient but also more competitive and more greener out of this crisis and well it looks like a question is it is it and or, or but well like a real politician I think it should be and 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 that's where also our task is now for example when you look at to a more resilient step we should make it's very useful that we came up of course with the recovery fund and because we should be uh well the economy uh should be well back on track as soon as possible so it's useful that we have that recovery fund but it, that's well it's more important that the member states also reform the economy so that the member states itself and thereby the european union could be more resilient and the other way is, of course, to make it more, well, let's say greener. So substantial investment must be made in the low and zero emission solutions, but also regarding the, the digitization and the production of course of alternative fuels. So then you can sort of plus plus, and hopefully we could make the sector in that way uh, more resilient, more competitive and more greener, but it should be an effort of both. And we are as legislators try to do our best well also also when you regards to the uh, when you look at the, the legislation we had uh, for example regarding the slots well but also the discussion about the budget was not in the way i like it to be honest but uh, there should be our task so speed up when it's possible um, and on the other hand try to do it together with the sector i think that's one of the important things to do to get it more competitive resilient and greener yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's as we were hearing about before, this is about maximizing the opportunity of the recovery. So on the one hand, we've seen airlines retiring older aircraft, less efficient aircraft, that's very positive for an environmentally friendly recovery. But we're also seeing airlines not having the funding to be able to immediately pull passengers right now to take delivery of the newer aircraft that are pushing through the environmental change. So it's a question about when airlines are on their knees in this crisis financially, where does the money then come from to be able to emerge greener, to emerge more efficient? I'm aware that a lot of the funding conditions have revolved around environmental measures, which has been a, a new chapter, I think, for the industry. So 
Is there a response there from the Parliament about how airlines might be able to access the funding to be able to make these changes? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. And what you see, um, well, let's say you see the support some uh, airlines get from their from national states, for uh, for example, KLM, but also, of course, Lufthansa. And I think that's a very good step forward. And I was, because what I think when you get that support from the local government, that's not because of only support that specific airline. It's, in my opinion, sort of the first, well, domino in a very long road. So uh, bankruptcy for airlines would have a major, major impact on the hub function of airports and, and airlines in total. And well, maybe one, one comment also regarding the, 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 the critical support sometimes from people, well, from different parts and not only the, uh, the Greenpeace part of other, but um, they sometimes I think they will not realize that the aviation sector contributes greatly to a country's GDP and that connectivity and direct access to other parts of the world is an important factor for companies also, also to settle headquarters in the country. And on the other hand, the, 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 the part they, they would like to take into making the sector more greener, more uh, innovative. So don't forget that. So I think the support from the national countries, what we see now, well, we should, we should support it. And on the other hand, what we could do is also to fund and to stimulate the innovations there, well, nowadays are, are going on. Well, when you look, I get, well, let's say two, two examples about, let's call it the next gen aviation. I think when you look at the, the hybrid uh, taxi trial they have on Schiphol Airport in my own country, helping airplanes to taxi without using their engine. A great example, the flying V airplane designed from uh, KLM together with, with the University of Delft, and yet they use 20% less fuel. If we could stimulate by funding these parts, that would be great. And maybe a last comment to make, and that's regarding the um, uh, MFF, uh, the Mental Built of Financial Framework. When you look around down, that 30% should be invested in more sustainability. Well, in my view, I hope, and I really hope that they will do, that a, a huge part of that 30% go to the transport sector. Because we, we, we say it's the backbone of the economy, well, show them that we see transport as the backbone of the economy. And I think that's very much a message that's coming from the industry. It's saying, look, we are critical and essential to GDP, to, to the productivity of economies. So therefore, we need to be able to have the resources to be able to provide that service and to do it in an ecologically friendly way. I'm going to bring Johan back in again there because I know that we were talking there about the um, uh, the projects that are underway in the Netherlands for um, for more in the environmentally friendly aircraft concepts. Johan, you've been working with Rose Electric on electric aircraft concepts yourselves. Um, can you say where you're at with that and whether or not this crisis has impacted EasyJet's ability to invest in environmental measures? emissions from the fuel that we we have do you hear me now all oh, right yeah so uh, yeah. Just to, to remind easyjet was the first major airline in the world who position to offset the carbon emission the fuel we're using we're seeing that as an as an interim step before you get on to the more ground in technologies that, that that will come and i think that we have reconfirmed our commitment to both our partners when it comes to doing this work because this will become more important rather than less important through this pandemic. We did a survey among customers who says that the issue around sustainability and the climate change is the number one topic, number one topic post the pandemic. Now, we believe that there's an opportunity that the government should recognize and incentivize the effort and, and carbon offsetting would it's not a perfect solution, but it's there, and it's there to make sure that we can push until we get on to the 
technologies that people would expect in 2030, 2035 to have a major impact at a large scale within this industry. And, and that is something that we, we are, you know, very, very, you know, clear about that that is an action the government should take. Now, this is my, this is my point, what I've said, what I said before. This is the reason why this is quite a to the industry has already happened. And the, the solution isn't that airlines and the industry should just take on more and more debt to try to manage its way through this. Because that means that, you know, unless those are written off, and they might be, I don't know, there might be some friendly governments out there who are very close to their uh, inefficient flagship carriers that will allow that to happen. But unless that is the case, you know, there will need to be funds to make that transition into those technologies. And that is a conscious effort that the government needs to make in order to make that happen. Otherwise, I, I think we are going to struggling to, to reach where we want to go. And that is basically that aviation can grow and it can thrive, but with less the environment. Once again, we call out on the decision makers now to take this opportunity to, to set those policies in place and make sure that that happens. And I think so far, I, I think that there are, you know, reason to be very critical about how the decision has been taken on national basis, not coordinated. And that has caused a lot of confusion and a lot of doubt that necessarily wasn't there. It's important to remember that the, the lack of demand we're seeing is based from the government associated policy restrictions. We can see that when when uh, destinations and, and routes are being removed from quarantines and air corridors are introduced, sales go through the roof. So people want to travel. They want to fly. It's all about making that happen in a coordinated effort by the decision makers across Europe. And they also have now the opportunity to make the transition into aviation being greener and having less impact on the environment with efforts such as carbon offsetting in the short term, but also then get on to the new ground breaking tech. That is going to need investment, it's going to need funds. Mm -hmm. So what you really need to see is, um, rather than what we heard this morning from the Commission, that the health ministers and the member states took this into their hands, this idea of the traffic light system of much more clarity that will help spark demand. Sparking demand will help aviation recover and it will give you the resources or part of the resources to be able to invest into the new technologies that have to be in place for, for the future. I'm just going to do a quick check in to see whether or not Sebastian is on the line. Uh, so Sebastian from IATA, if you're around, uh, please check in now. And yes, I'm, I'm, I'm here since, since, since the beginning of the discussion. Uh, apologies, Sebastian, I wasn't able to hear you there at the beginning oh. of the discussion. So no problem. <laughs> bring you in now then. And also a reminder to the audience that please do go ahead and post some Slido questions because I'll come back to those in a moment. So Sebastian, from what's been discussed so far, I mean, we've already covered a bit on funding about the regulatory response and about technology measures. Whereabouts is IATA at on that? What would you really like to see happen to create a strong recovery? Um, so, um, yeah, I was I was I was listening carefully um, the, the discussion and um, forgive me, but I'll be a little more pessimistic because um, you, we have been using I mean, um, you, you, you have been using the word recovery uh, in this discussion. I uh, from our perspective, we are not at the stage of the recovery. We are still at the stage of the survival. Um, so I would like very much to discuss the possibility of uh, uh, growing the market. W what we see today. Um, uh, is that, uh, as, uh, as, as uh, Johan was mentioning, there is a great demand and there is a confidence. We, we've done a, a survey uh, which we are spreading quite broadly um, the, the results, but because 86% of travel, of, of people who travel since June feel safe on the planes with all the COVID uh, measures. So there is no problem of, of perception of the airlines. There is no problem of uh, willingness to, to travel. But there is two things. First, uh, Airlines are shrinking their capacity and and uh, uh, reducing their, their 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 size. I mean, you know, every morning we hear about airlines uh, uh, laying off people and and grounding planes. Uh, but the second and maybe most important now is that we 
we see this effect of, of opening and closing markets. And in this industry, it's all about predictability. If you cannot predict, it's of course the, 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 the financial way of running an airline, but it's mainly from passenger side. And what we are looking after is of course passengers. If you cannot predict that you're gonna be flying, you just don't have the demand and that's the that's the the i mean the basic uh, the basic thing so for example in, in in our statistics what we observed also is the um big um uh, is is an important shortening of the booking period so people are buying uh tickets now i mean the passengers are buying tickets like within 10 days uh, before traveling while they used to 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 on average uh, buy them 60 days before travel so it creates um uh, a spiral effect. Yeah, you have an effect when passengers don't trust that they'll fly, so they don't buy the tickets. Then airlines are not really keen on increasing the network and increasing the production of, of flying, just because they don't know if the passengers and the bookings will uh, will come. Of course, on top of that, we had what was mentioned uh, in, in this discussion. So I'll just reiterate and then reinforce it. If you have any form of quarantine. Uh, so you don't know if you will be quarantined on the on arrival to a destination, or you will be quarantined on departure then there is it's it's absolutely equivalent to closing a market i mean if you say to someone you you might go but you will have to spend and doesn't matter if it's 7 10 or 14 days this market we consider is shut down and uh, the, the, our our just different uh, surveys are showing that uh, with quarantine the market uh, demand is lower by 99.8% so basically only people who really need to travel for some emergency uh, will, will 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 go there so before we talk about recovery, and you know, I, it's very easy for me because I agreed with everything that was said. We, uh, we want to be greener. We want to have more, um, have investments, etc. The problem is that in my mind, in what I see every day, we are still in the phase where we ask ourselves how many airlines will survive it, how many airlines, and I'm not talking only Europe. Um, y yesterday we had another statistics which is showing that on average, on average, it, of course, that's the problem of the average. Uh, is that airlines has around six months of cash ahead. So basically you have airlines who have none completely and you have those who have some reserves. But if you take the average, it's six months. It means that if this situation of opening, closing continues, we will see a situation of a second wave of, of, of uh, handing, uh, I mean, I know, going to the shareholders to ask for, for, for money, be it debt or be it any type of, of waivers, but uh, of, of fees. But airlines will just not not survive. So I believe that in the next months, we, I mean, and this is our priority, it's all about creating a framework which, um, which allows uh, a sanitary response to a sanitary problem. Because today we see that it's, even if when we talk in ICAO about it, even if we talk with EASA or whoever, we may have a nice discussion, but at the end is the sanitary authority who says, go, no go, and the Minister of Transport just have to follow what, what's, uh, uh, what's acceptable by sanitary authorities. So we need the testing. We are pushing very much for testing. Same system of testing for everybody. I could develop it for, for, for a long time. But generally what we want is to have one standard that will allow all passengers to travel between countries, between big hubs, without differentiation most likely one test only on, on departure. So we have predictability. So even if the virus, which will stay, you know, the level are changing, we can still know that people, uh, our customers will be able to fly and therefore the whole system will have the money to finance research, development, airports. Um, I mean, every, all the ecosystem that is around us and, you know, was growing so well together with us for the last, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know, uh, before the grand, big financial crisis, so at least 12, 12 years. Yes, that's, that's how we see it. So this is why I'm a little more pessimistic on using the word recovery. I would actually love to see recovery and have the debate about recovery. Yeah, um, building on that, we have a question from the audience, Bastian, um, saying, well, there's a lot of talk about common travel policy and ending blanket quarantines. How do you actually get that implemented? The question is to me? Yeah. So um, we, we, we have to, uh, first of all, we have to see that there is a great progress in testing. So the famous PCR test, which was the test that uh, uh, used to be um, the, the most common until, uh, until now was, uh, was quite long and required heavy, heavy uh, installations. What we are advocating is to create a system in which 
the, the fact of arriving of very new antigen uh, tests, which are 15 minutes tests, will allow the sanitary authorities, because again, it's, it's with them the main, uh, the main effort, to have a system in which just pre-departure you can be tested and consider safe. The logic is to have a one, one, um, uh, one test system that allows passengers to be considered fit to fly a, in a logic of the security test. You know, now you have this common screening. Once you go through the screening, you're considered um, in the clean area versus the dirty area where, where you can have some dangerous objects. So we are trying to apply the same logic. Of course, as IATA, we go beyond just the European problem because, of course, the intra-European problem is is, uh, is is the same. And by the way, it, the Commission and many European institutions are very strongly also advocating uh, for 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 the testing uh, alliance for Europe. I, I think I can say safely that we are all on the same on the same page. But what we need is to be able to have a standard which will not allow, uh, which will allow and be accepted by mutual countries. So our methodology, our answer to that is through ICAO, because ICAO represents all the states and has a, a, a group, a subgroup with lots of medical advisors that is trying to promote a standard and recommend the standard. Of course, then the countries will have freedom to implement it or not. But what we believe is that if the 2021 countries, which are the leading countries, accept one standard, there will be a follow-up, a natural follow-up that will allow airlines to plan not only short haul but also long haul because one of the key issues today is that we have long haul who is who is closed uh, uh, and, and for me you know long haul is, is um, uh, one of the main elements that creates connectivity of course intra-european intra-asian connectivity is extremely important but when you cannot extract yourself from the continent then it becomes uh, extremely difficult to talk about recovery so one standard one answer that will allow to have clear rules and not rules per country, per market, which which then, of course, we are also against any type of subjective judgment on who can fly where. This is why we have the Chicago Convention and this is why we have bilateral agreements that allow the skies to be open. Thank you and apologies again for the... No, 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 it's me. I'm, I'm sorry. Earlier. Um, I think we're going to have to wrap up there and uh, in a moment I'll hand it, uh, the session back to Thomas. But really what I'm hearing from all of the panelists is that we've ended up in a situation which was beyond everybody's control. It was beyond the control of the regulators. It was beyond the control of the airlines, beyond the control of the passengers. But the common theme that seems to be coming through here is that if we're still in survival mode now, like Sebastian said, we really need that predictability for the industry to even begin to move forward. And I think going back to that spiral staircase metaphor, it seems as though the airlines could actually be the lower steps of that spiral staircase where we might be able to build some kind of economic recovery. So thank you very much to my panel of speakers and I'll now hand you back to Thomas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Victoria. Thank you very much, Victoria and Dan, for uh, first of all for moderating uh, uh, the uh, uh, very interesting uh, sessions, the two panels. Um, thank you to um, all of the speakers uh, who have joined us today, and uh, thank you for uh, your valuable time. Thank you also for those people who um, have asked questions uh, via the uh, the Slido. Um, I think maybe to uh, quickly wrap up, but in the interest of time, um, is that uh, it's quite. It's been quite clear again uh, today's discussion uh, that uh, the core challenge is uh, for all of us is how to regain uh, the um, confidence, uh, the trust of, of the passenger. Um, we all seem to realize that passengers are really willing to travel, but we still uh, see the main uh, bottleneck there is that member states, national governments across Europe are just not capable of uh, coordinating uh, the, the travel restrictions. Uh, I also have taken note uh, throughout the debate, uh, uh, the note uh, that there is support of the European Commission's uh, proposal uh, for its recommendation to the Council to have a better coordination amongst these travel, uh, for these travel restrictions. And we also have taken note of the German proposal at Council level, 
Uh, discussions on that, um, on, 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 on this policy issue will continue in the next couple of, uh, of, of weeks. And um, uh, I would propose let's continue to work together, all of us, uh, especially the next couple of weeks, to make sure that we have a successful outcome uh, from the Council, uh, which in, in our view, uh, I believe there is some common understanding, uh, means not just a recommendation, but actually uh, rules that are being implemented uh, in a coordinated way, uh, in which uh, an, uh, um, quarantines um, are only being implemented if there's absolutely no other alternative, uh, and that we extend, of course, the uh, the possibility for for uh, testing that that makes sense. So at the end of the day, yes, indeed, it's not only about traffic of aircraft; it's also about um, load the load factor of of the aircraft. I don't think it's been mentioned, but I think the average in Europe today we have a load factor of fifty five percent. So that needs to go up. So let's focus together on, on how to regain passenger confidence. And as Sebastian also uh, said, it, I totally agree with Sebastian. Uh, we are not in the recovery phase yet. We're still in a phase that we are trying to uh, survive as a sector. Uh, and I believe we can only do that if we work together, uh, not only amongst industry, but also amongst policymakers. So thank you very much. And I hope you can uh, join us for our next event. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye.